Hello everyone, I'm Dan Jones. Welcome to Interchange. Thank you so very much for joining us. We've got lots to talk about again today. It's a new year and we have a new governor, so we'll talk about Scott Walker and how he's doing so far. We'll talk about the problems at the Mayfair Shopping Center and whether Mayfair is doing enough to address the situation. We'll talk about the Milwaukee Catholic Archdiocese filing for bankruptcy, and we will talk about the Green Bay Packers and the playoffs. Okay, joining us tonight, our newspaper columnist, Joel McNally. Gerard Randall, consultant and local job creation expert. And Denise Calloway, the coordinator of business and community partnerships for the Milwaukee Public School System. Rick Horowitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. Let's talk first about our new governor, Scott Walker. I think he made it pretty clear that the thrust of his tenure is going to be aimed at doing everything he can to create an environment which will lead to business expansion and more jobs, and that he is going to do it without raising any taxes, period. Pretty good agenda as far as I'm concerned. I think he's done well so far. So far, he's named a cabinet. Uh, people were waiting anxiously for uh, those names to start to roll out. And, and actually, I thought that um, there were some pretty good choices that uh, have been made. And it went pretty deep. I didn't realize that um, there would be as many deputies and administrative assistants uh, or executive assistants that would be named. And so they went fairly deep in most departments in naming the leadership for those agencies. Uh, his legislative agenda is going to be pretty crammed because many in the legislature have their own ideas of what they'd like to see move through as well. And so there's going to be some coordination issues. Um, there will be uh, the issues of prioritizing what the legislature is going to advance first. Um, there are some people that would like to move through some of the things that uh, have been on their plate for a long time. Those aren't necessarily the highest priority, uh, and the Walker administration is going to have to continually keep in front of legislative leadership uh, those priorities that create jobs, uh, reduce uh, government spending at the state level, and those things that take some of the pressure off of state government that are federal mandates. I think those will be the three high priorities. And of course, he's already laid out. He doesn't want to increase taxes. Uh, if he is able to keep the legislature on task and they continue to cooperate with him, uh, utilizing the numbers that they have as the majority party, uh, I think that uh, he'll be served well. And in this wrinkle uh, of what to do will also be legislative redistricting. Uh, the redistricting. And I think <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, those are the kinds of things that actually cause hiccups or distractions, uh, political distractions that uh, may be the only thing that upends his uh, advancement of, of, of his priorities. Denise, I know you're not a huge fan of the guy, but any surprises oh, so I, far? I, no, I mean, I, I like Scott Walker. I think he's a, I think he's a, a great guy, and I, I hope as I think uh, other people do on this panel and around the state, that he's going to be a great governor for the state of Wisconsin because we need one. Um, and he's done what he <laughs> said he was going to do. Um, you know, he's not let any moss grow under his feet. He's moving forward this agenda that he's talked about. Um, we'll see what happens when the legislature comes back to talk about jobs and what needs to be done. I think George's right. His challenge is going to be there are a lot of Republicans who may have had some pent-up legislative desires that they would like to have taken care of that are not priorities for the Walker administration. And I think the challenge for the, the governor and for the leadership is going to be making sure they stay on task and on message. You know, a, a lot of times, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, when you, you find that you're holding the constitutional office and you have the legislature, you're thinking, hey, this is smooth sailing. We can get things done what we want that we want to get done. But a funny thing sometimes happens on the way to making legislation, and that is that there are people who have their own ideas that they feel very passionately about, and they want to see those move forward. I know one of our favorites is, is, is likely to come up again, and that's that whole <laughs> issue of raw milk in Wisconsin. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think that... The, Governor Walker is very focused on what he wants to do. I think the legislative leadership is. The problem is going to be um, getting all those folks in, in line. You know, sometimes um, it can be like herding cats. you got to make sure everybody's working together, and I think that's going to be a challenge. You know, I thought it was kind of funny. Shirley Abramson, uh, the chief justice, when she was speaking, made it very clear that we are three separate branches of government, <laughs> almost sending a message, don't try to control the court. Uh, is Walker going to be able to control the legislature? I don't know. I mean, uh, 
Denise mentioned the raw milk thing, which is a, a silly issue to bring up the first week the governor uh, is in office. Uh, uh, but I, uh, I guess I got to differ with both of you a little bit in that I am still waiting uh, to hear what Scott Walker is going to do to create jobs, jobs, and more jobs, which he says is his number one priority. Uh, you know, we know that before he even got in office, you know, he threw away $810 million, which could have created jobs in, in Wisconsin. And then when he, uh, he released his agenda for creating jobs in the state of Wisconsin, there was, uh, you know, make it harder for people who are injured by products uh, or, or killed, uh, you know, to sue the people who injure or kill them. Uh, I don't think that's a big job creator in the state of Wisconsin. I don't think most corporations or businesses in the state of Wisconsin uh, create products that injure or kill people. Uh, but that was a big, that was number one on the item, uh, on the agenda. And number two on the agenda was make it harder for the elderly who are who are poorly treated in nursing homes for them to collect uh, you know to sue nursing homes for negligent care or killing uh, your loved your elderly loved ones make it harder for them to sue the nursing home industry uh, is that the, the what he means by creating jobs is to protect some of the worst businesses that do some of the worst practices in the state of Wisconsin is that what you know, businesses have been waiting for to hear from Wisconsin. Uh, boy, you know, it's going to be harder for them to sue us if we put out shoddy products or if we treat people badly and hurt them. Uh, well, let's go to Wisconsin and open up our businesses. That it, it does not make sense to me that those are big job creation issues. And I'm still waiting to hear what his job creation issues are because these are just, you know, a, a wish list of some of the worst business practices in the state of Wisconsin. And I hope that's not what he means. All right, next top topic. More problems at Mayfair last weekend, and once again, the problems were caused by misbehaving black teenagers. So what's Mayfair's response? Well, instead of just banning teens unaccompanied by adults on Fridays and Saturdays, afternoons and evenings, we'll ban them on Sunday afternoon and evening as well. That's a pretty lame response. If it was my mall, I'd ban them seven days a week, 24 <laughs> hours a day. Why don't you just kill no them? Kill them. No right. teenagers in the mall. No, 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 no. No teenagers who aren't accompanied by an adult. Kill them. Okay. Seven days a week. I don't know. Um, I, money, I don't. don't I don't always want to go into hot topic with my <laughs> with my fifteen year old. So I'd be a little concerned about that. You know, it, it is a it's a deeper issue. You know, this is the issue that's but not gotten, for the mall management. It's not a deeper issue. It, it's well, it, how I, do we maintain a comfortable environment for people who want to come here and spend money? Right, and I and I think at the end of the day, that is the mall's issue. I mean, it is. They've got to figure out a way in which they can adequately address these issues. Um, you know, whether you, you take a look at the issue of the incidents that happened on Sunday or the incidents that almost happened uh, the, the week before, you know, kids have a way now of communicating through Facebook and other social media about these things that they want to do that as adults we need, need to be able to get their hands on. I don't know what else Mayfair can do um, and Bayshore adopted the same the same regulation, the same rules, short of what they're doing right now, unless you just say you want to ban teenagers altogether. Um, and I think it's unfortunate that kids who go to the mall, shop, hang out, whatever, and don't have any kind of issues or problems at all, are now penalized by the actions of, all things considered, a relatively small number of kids. But, you know, I, I think that what we need to realize is that you know, we, we have to find a way as a community, as parents, as adults in the community, to make sure that kids understand that this is not acceptable behavior. It's not fun to, you know, run through a Boston store and knock over racks. It's not fun, you know, to go in and cause mayhem. So I think as adults, we need to make sure that we reinforce those messages. For those kids who were arrested, I, I think those kids ought to face some pretty serious consequences. Um, I think it depends on what they did, and we still don't know, uh, honestly. Uh, you know, all the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together, so the king called for more horses and more men. And that's what these shopping malls do every time. Instead of dealing with the problems, uh, instead of trying to deal with the kids, uh, they just do more of the same, which is more security, more heavy-handed policies, more bans, more keep them out of here, uh, which... Obviously, I think this incident on Sunday, I think it is. I don't know because the reporting on it has been so bad. We don't really know what happened. But uh, I think it is was kids who were already alienated from that mall 
kids who had already been treated badly. I stopped going to Mayfair Mall pretty much because I didn't like the response of security and management out there to, to ordinary kids. Uh, they treat everybody like a criminal. And uh, I, I felt uncomfortable around that myself. Uh, so I don't go out there unless I have to. Uh, but they need to somehow deal with their young customers. Uh, not by you know being more heavy-handed and and more obnoxious towards them, but uh, first of all, sit down and talk to them and find out what the heck is going on. Uh, you know, just bringing in more security and more security till it's till it's you know armed guards out there is not going to make it a pleasant place to shop. Uh, and these kids, kids today are consumers. They are, and, and the malls are, in fact, are gathering places. They're the only gathering places in those communities for young people, pretty much. Uh, and there has to be a way to declare a truce. Um, I, I, I think some things were exaggerated in the reporting. There was a shot fired, they said. We have no idea if that had anything to do with these kids. That was outside, it was at a bus stop. Uh, no one has ever said it was a, it was a young person involved in that. Uh, there's a lot of alarmist reporting and, and no one is sitting down and actually talking about what to do is, other than bring in more security. Is, is it valid to, to bring in the topic of Northridge and Capitol Court and Grand Avenue and the argument by some that it's African-American teenagers that screwed up Northridge, that screwed up Grand Avenue, that screwed up Capitol Court. We can't let the same thing happen to Mayfair. Is that is that valid to talk about that? Well, I think that is where the alarmist conversation comes in. I, I'm not seeing much more than a loose connection between uh, a failed mall, a failing mall, and a mall that's actually thriving uh, that people suspect. Uh, certain incidents may lead to some failure. Malls primarily are there to make money, number one. Number two, they have become social gathering places, not just for young people, but for older people as well. In the mornings, you can go into malls and you can find that uh, people are utilizing them as places to socialize, to move around, to exercise. Uh, so they are gathering places, whether we want them to be that or not. Young people do spend money. Unfortunately, we had an incident, and we've had other incidents where uh, young people have come in, and they've really established a bad reputation for young people as a result, and they make it more difficult for people who are reasonable to make an argument for why there ought not be more stringent measures put in place to control their behavior. And I don't know whether or not that's the responsibility of a mall other than to provide for the safety of everyone who's there. And what is kind of weird, though, is that Mayfair has bent over backwards to try to do everything it can so to far. attract young people. Right. They right. put in but this giant they, movie theater, right. they, they put in the right. whole second floor, and right. they all They aimed, spend aimed money, and they are responsible for many of these malls having the, profit, the profitability that they have. So if you take that component away, they're not crazy. They don't want kids out of there altogether. They just want kids that are there that are going to spend money and will behave themselves and allow for other customers to feel safe and secure and when they, they come there to spend money. And they know that kids won't come as much if they have to come with mommy and daddy. But, but well, you know, I talk, think talk to the kids, too. I, these I think kids Joel's know right. what's going on. They know, they know why some of these kids are causing right. problems. You have to, I think Joel's right, you have to engage kids in some of this. Really? And I, I think you do have to engage them in this discussion. I mean, if they're part of the problem, you need to be able to talk to kids. I'm not suggesting you, you go to these nine kids who were arrested and ask them what they think. But you have to talk to kids to find out what are the issues that they have surrounding the mall. If you are in there at three o'clock on, uh, you know, on Saturday or or now Sunday, and you know the mall is getting ready to close, man, I mean they are are pretty tough in terms of stopping any kid who they might think be, you know, might be violating this rule. So I think part of it is you do have to go back and find out, is there a perception, right or wrong, but a perception among kids that they're treated unfairly at the mall? Well, I'll tell um, you and what if that's the case, then, I mean, then you need to take some steps to address that. So you've got a pressure valve that you can release in terms of kids feeling that they've been heard and relieving what they may feel is some unfair treatment. They may well have some good that ideas. this happened just before school was to start back up again leads me to believe this was more than just an, uh, 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 an isolated and unplanned event. I do believe that it was planned. I'm still waiting to see what evidence they have that will show that. But it, it was telling that they are looking 
at certain signals in social media utilized by kids to determine whether or not these kinds of things are incidents that they can head off at the pass, so to speak. But I don't like that either. I do not like the fact that these kids chose this as an opportunity to protest whatever. And if they're going to use uh, marketing strategies to determine to talk to young people to see what it is that will make the malls more attractive and safe for them, uh, I got no problem with that. But I do want to see the ones that are involved in this punished. All right, next topic. Let's talk about the Milwaukee Archdiocese filing for bankruptcy this week in response to all the legal claims made against it in connection with the child abuse cases. Maybe I'm too cynical, but after so many years of the diocese being less than forthcoming in addressing this issue, I do wonder if this is a simply a legal step being taken to further protect the archdiocese from financial failure, which... Denise, I guess, is what bankruptcy is all about anyway. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. It's what bankruptcy is all about. Um, it's what seven other archdioceses have done around the country um, when they found themselves in this trouble with this kind of financial risk. Protect your ass Protect assets your as your much asset. as you can. That's right. I mean, that's what it's about for them. I, I think that it is unfortunate that it came to this point with the archdiocese. Um, because, you know what, nobody wins in a case like this. Um, there are questions about whether or not the archdiocese is really doing this because it's concerned about any kind of fiduciary risk that it has, or if it's simply a matter of trying to continue to protect its reputation and protect some priest. I, I, you know, the, I, the whole I issue of bankruptcy higher. kind of... even higher than that. Uh, this is not an individual archdiocese issue. Uh, this was the leadership of the, of the Catholic Church from the top. We now know there's plenty of evidence pointing to the current, to the current pope and the way he responded to some of the, the knowledge that they had at the very top. Individual archdioceses uh, didn't all decide to, to follow the same policies across the country and around the world uh, to keep this stuff covered up. The Catholic Church is one of the richest institutions on the face of the earth. And for the Milwaukee Archdiocese to have to try to hide some of its assets uh, because it's being treated by the worldwide Catholic Church. Well, how, how absurd uh, for it to be able to say, uh, yes, we're going to file for bankruptcy, but it doesn't include the schools. It doesn't include <laughs> or, the churches. Or right. all the funds we have. Or, right. So, I mean, yeah. what other assets do you really yeah, have? Yeah, the yeah. Cousin Center? Uh, you know. Uh, but but this, is a, this is a worldwide problem and a, a problem of the church all over the world. And the, the Milwaukee Archdiocese was carrying out the policies that, that were being carried out up and down the leadership of that church. And, and the, you're absolutely right. They're, they're focusing on the financial side and not the moral side, uh, which is appalling when this worldwide institution is supposed to be a religious institution. But there are, there are many people, though, that say Listecki is doing a great job saying, OK, let's bring this to a head, deal with it so we don't have to deal with it for the next decade and be done with it. I think a lot of people are tired of dealing with it. Mm. Let's get something straight. First off, the Milwaukee Archdiocese is not like the Chicago Archdiocese where all of the in the instance of Chicago, where all of the property is owned literally by the archbishop. That is not the case here. Whatever properties, no matter how you segment it out, schools, hospitals, individual accounts, those, those assets are the property of the people of this archdiocese that are the Roman Catholic faith. They gave the money. They never gave the money with the intention of having the money go to settle these kinds of suits. And they continue to give with the expectation that this money is not going to go. Otherwise, they would put it in some special account for that purpose. So when the archdiocese makes the claim that it's going into bankruptcy to protect those assets, they have to keep in mind the purpose that people gave that money for and protect that money for that purpose, protect those assets for that purpose. This is not the same kind of suit as someone who slips and falls in a church on a floor and wants to settle with an insurance company. Yes, what happened is horrible, but you are also looking at people who were individuals that ought to be held individually responsible, and you ought to look at whatever damages you can recover from those individuals that you recover for the harm that they did both to the church and to the people that they hurt individually. I just don't think that uh, the church assets ought to be spent in this manner. And I, I, I think it was a wise move to protect it this way. All right, shifting gears completely. 
So the Packers squeaked by the Bears last weekend to grab a playoff spot against Philadelphia. Can they look as anemic as they did last weekend <laughs> and still beat Philadelphia? I mean, you, 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 you watched until the end of that game going, please. I know, it, it depends I know. on which Packers team shows up. I mean, they've been so inconsistent all year, really. They have looked absolutely magnificent the week before. Uh, uh, and, and they have, at times, all season long, at the same time, they've had a couple real crap games and and uh you're lucky that philadelphia you know <laughs> they played chicago played, so, played yeah. such a poor game against oh, them terrible. or that said a lot about the defense uh but the offense wasn't there last week so was it, um, was it aaron Rodgers, the leading rusher for the packers uh, the last Mac week oh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. uh they certainly can win uh, if 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 they are, are hitting on all cylinders they they could they could go all the way Philly's not a great team either, though. Well, it's not a Michael great Vick's team, but great. Michael Vick is pretty great. So, I mean, what's going to happen? What What's going to happen is Michael Vick going to play, um, and how well is he going to be able to play? That I think Michael Vick changes the entire complexion of the game. I mean, he is a, he's a great quarterback when he's on. And he it's has that mobility. To be extremely windy. Yeah. How so, does that affect the passing game? Well, I think it, it doesn't do the passing game well at all. <laughs> it doesn't. But you know what? If you're Michael Vick and you're playing, you don't need to pass because you run the ball yourself. Right. So um, I think in that kind of a situation, if Michael Vick plays, he's a very dangerous threat to the Packers, and, and that's going to be a little bit of a problem. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 I'm hopeful. <laughs> but, I mean, we're going to have to wait and see what happens on Sunday. And, you know, the thing with the Packers – when they have these seasons where they have flashes of brilliance and flashes of, <laughs> well, where they're not so brilliant, um, it, you, you don't know consistently from week to week what team is going to show up. So let's say we get past Philadelphia. Well, what happens the week after that? Sometimes I think in Packer land we tend to prolong the agony, um, you know, when our team is just not doing as well. As you do can. wonder who's going to show up. Is it is, is, uh Rogers going to be more like Brett Favre used to be, or is it going to be more like Lynn Dickey? <laughs> well, well, there's a line in there, but I, I'm going to let that go. I do believe that the Packers at this point in time have more horses than Philadelphia has. But it's a home game for Philadelphia. And I always have to give in playoff situations the advantage to the home team. Let's say the Packers squeak by and Aaron Rodgers does some miraculous things without having – uh, a key running back. I mean, they really don't have mm -hmm. a running game, and now that Ryan Grant is out, they're even in a more precarious position of being able to advance the ball with some kind of option. They don't have that. and Unless, of course, Aaron Rodgers is out there, and the guy has two concussions already yeah. this season. How much are they really going to take a chance with him running the ball again? I don't think that's going to be the case. So, you, you've got a case where even if they pull it out in Philadelphia, it's a seeded kind of tournament. You've got the wild card team playing the, mm -hmm. the top mm -hmm. of whoever is left in the, in, in the fracas. And I just, I just don't see them making it very far, even though I hope that they do. Uh, I would like to see them advance as far as – People had expected that they would, and, and people had Super Bowl visions in <laughs> in their heads at the beginning of the season. That's right. The people are a lot <laughs> wiser now <laughs> because they know what we've got. <laughs> All right. You know, the turning of the calendar means more than just the start of the playoffs. Now it's time for Rick Horowitz. Here's hoping that this new year brings you all the joy that you deserve and tires that grip the road ahead to let you handle every curve. Here's hoping that your job is safe, your health robust, your mortgage paid. Here's hoping that you never have to hear the words, mistakes were made. Here's hoping that your warranties last longer than your products do. Here's hoping the patrol car in your rear view isn't after you. Here's hoping for a lasting peace, a common bond, a noble goal. Here's hoping that BP learns how to stick a plug inside a hole. Here's hoping for a ray of sunshine breaking through your darkest dark. Here's hoping for a whole lot less of Sarah P., the queen of snark. Here's hoping that your Powerball selections won't be always cursed. Here's hoping politicians ditch the stunts and put the country first. Here's hoping that a tank of gas costs something less than 50 bucks. And crazy people in the street won't tell you how the planet sucks. Here's hoping that the kids remember half of what you'd like them to. 
Here's hoping that the things they don't forget are even partly true. Here's hoping for the coldest beer, the finest wine, the smoothest scotch. Here's hoping that the shouting heads of cable turn it down a notch. Here's hoping that you see the ones you love through warm and gentle eyes. And when you see you're in the wrong, you'll manage to apologize. Here's hoping that the days to come are better than the days behind. That someone makes you smile or giggle, even if you're not inclined. Here's hoping, just to sum it up, that you enjoy the best of times. A new year bright with promise and a basket of your favorite rhymes. Thank you, Rick, and thank you so much for watching. Stay warm and enjoy the rest of your weekend.